Hello friends, how's it going? It's Matty listening to Looking Sideways Action Sports Podcast. It's the show where I try and cover the most interesting stories in action sports and other related endeavours. Thanks for tuning in, hope you enjoy this episode. If it is your first time listening to the show, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Go and check out the archive over at my website www.wearelookingsideways.com. You can find full show notes for every episode. There's a blog, you can sign up to the newsletter, loads of stuff. Go and have a look. This week's guest, Leo Baker. Well, the search for our authentic self is a lifelong process and not always a successful one for everybody. It takes a huge amount of self-honesty and a willingness to embrace consistent and at times not always comfortable evolution. Now, it's something we've all got to face, whether consciously or realized or not. But imagine undergoing this entire process as a world-renowned skateboarder while also try to juggle both wider societal pressures and those of an extremely patriarchal industry who've tied your own career success to their very restrictive definitions of gender. This is exactly the position Leo Baker faced at the height of their initial success. And it's why there's so much more to Leo's story than just the actual skateboarding. Although, let's be honest, it's really worth pointing out just how high profile a skateboarder Leo is. Leo is definitely one of the defining skaters of their generation, as the countless X Games and Street League wins demonstrate, as do the crossover indicators of success, such as the recent news that they'll be the first non-binary and third out LGBTQ skateboarder to appear in the next reboot of the Tony Hawk Pro Skater video game series. Yeah, Leo's got a pretty massive profile, let's put it that way. Today, as they explained during our conversation, Leo is proud to be living authentically as the most high-profile, non-binary, trans skateboarder in the world. And yet, as Leo explained during our chat, gaining the understanding and self-confidence required to finally present as their authentic self has been a long and very, very involved process. It's involved dealing with the collateral damage and mental health issues that have accrued along the way, and ultimately committing to a measured and long-term approach to self-care, which is something that we talk about in quite some detail I'm going to say Leo's story is one of the most important in modern skateboarding and I'm pretty grateful that they've trusted me to tell it in their own way and in their own words. So that's what we did. I'll be back at the end but here's me and Leo Baker. Enjoy. I think the obvious place to start is uh, Tony Hawk 2 (laughs) really. Um, which which is like been announced what in the last two weeks? Um, yeah. Well, obvi- like, obviously you obviously you knew about it for longer, but um, yeah, right. it's kind of been the big the big announcement. So that is pretty amazing. So how are you feeling about that? I mean, I'm obviously in complete shock about it because I grew up playing that game, like many of us in my generation. Regardless of if you skate or not, it's like everybody played that game at least once. So you know, it's pretty amazing. It's an amazing experience for me because, you know, like I played that game and by playing it, by hearing the terminology Tony Hawk's pro skater, that's like how I knew you could be a pro skater. And then I told my mom, like, I want to be a pro skater. So it's funny that it's like come full circle. And I was like texting with my mom. She's super excited about just the fact that I'm in that game. And like, I was like, yeah, I guess I did it. (laughs) I guess I became a pro skater. And and we both laughed because... I don't know. It's just a cute moment because my mom, obviously, it's like one of her most, I don't know. She's like really loves that memory of me running in the house being like, I want to be a pro skater. Right. And her how old just, were you when, how old was, were you then? <clears throat> I think I was like eight years old or something. Wow. Okay. So yeah. Pre- yeah. Right. So that's your whole life. You've been kind of building towards this, this yeah. moment then. Yeah. So it's yeah. pretty, it's a pretty rad like benchmark for me and like everything I've been yeah, working towards, you know. Is it is it one of those things with your mom, like, where, I mean, obviously she understands what you do in your career, but, you know, is it one of those ones where she finally kind of gets how big it is? Do you know what I mean? Like, where it's, like, almost the, the thing where it's, like, wow, okay, you have actually achieved something pretty... Because, obviously, Tony Hawk has that... And, I mean, the game, obviously, it's so funny referring to the game rather than the person, but it does have that cultural standing doesn't it you know like it is that big a deal Um, yeah yeah for sure it's um it's cool because you know like 
obviously when the Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 and 2 came out, it's like the people, the roster of skaters in the games are like obvious legends, right? You know, so it's like, I feel like to some degree, it's like some like, uh, I don't know, like a, like a a gold star or something of like, you made it this far or something, but. um, Yeah, I mean, you could see that when, um, you know, like, there was the get together last year, wasn't there? When like Jamie Thomas was there, and you know all the original, all the original guys that were in it, and y- the pride was evident. You know, like the the kind of like you know, it's it, it's a big deal. It means something, basically. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And the way they announced the game too, just like instead of being like eight new skaters, they were just like eight new legends. And I was like, wow, <laughs> like I just felt all like warm and fuzzy inside like I really made it or something (laughs) so when did when did you first get approached for it um had to be I would say like at least a year ago something like that because I had to go in and like like take all the photos and like do all the outfits and all that stuff and like I think it's been somewhere around a year so it's been like a pretty well-kept secret you know like nobody knew the game was coming let alone the eight new skaters and all that stuff. But I think another thing too that's really special about it is the fact that it is a reboot of Tony Hawk 1 and 2. So those were the two that I played when I was a kid. So yeah. and like you know when you're playing those games as a kid you're like imagining yourself doing those tricks or like skating. Like you know what I mean? It's like you're imagining yourself in the game and now that I can like I'm actually like seeing myself in the game it's like the biggest mind fuck because I'm just like, wow, I can't believe like this is happening. Like it's so surreal. Yeah. So how did that feel? I must've been really bizarre. Like to see yourself almost like, you know, you see yourself as a superhero or something. You know what I mean? Like to, to see yourself as that character. Must yeah. Be a really, like, like, like you said, surreal experience. Yeah, for sure. Well, I saw, cause they, sh- the first time I saw the in game, like, like footage, like demo or whatever of like me in the game, I was just like completely blown away. Like I can't even find words to describe like what it felt like to see myself like in a video game, in the game that I played, in those same levels that I was playing that I was imagining myself in, now I'm in. Like, I don't know, it's just so many layers to it that make it like just really surreal. It's like a huge honor, a super humbling experience for sure. Yeah. obviously the first non-binary skater in the game's history as well so that feels significant you know that that feels like a real like a a real sort of benchmark for the for skateboarding absolutely yeah do you feel that yeah for sure i absolutely agree with that just because um well going back to when i was a kid obviously i saw Alyssa steamer in the very first game which obviously is amazing you know that's like yeah one of the coolest things ever and so by seeing that when I was a kid, I realized there was like one other like girl skater. You know, like when I was that young, it was like, oh, I guess I'm a girl. So like, whatever. I was like, I really thought it was just me and Alyssa Steamer. (laughs) And we were the only two like girl skaters or like non-male skaters in the whole world. Like that's really what I thought in my brain. So, So that representation obviously was really important. And so fast forward 20 years, here we are, whatever. Um, And there's like, the roster is super diverse. And so I, I often think about like, you know, if I was to see someone like me in a video game when I was a kid, maybe my whole path wouldn't have been what it was, you know? Like maybe I would have been able to like more freely express my gender at a much younger age or like have a coming of age, like in my actual teen years, instead of trying to live up to this industry standard of what like a woman, quote unquote, woman skater should look like, right? So. Yeah. So yeah, so I and and I've been getting a lot of like just like comments on Instagram and stuff just people being like this is a win for like all trans and like non-binary kids in the future who get to see themselves in this video game. That's obviously has such a cultural impact already. So so yeah, it feels super important and very timely and just like Yeah. I'm I'm happy I like came out just like right before <laughs> you know the game was happening and like as the game was in the process of being made, I actually told them about my name change and stuff. So like, sure, I'm like, like really dodged a bullet there. Cause could you imagine like the game comes out and then I'm like, oh, hi, I'm like, I'm trans. So 
<laughs> I actually yeah, don't right. use that name anymore yeah. or whatever. <laughs> that would have been a, kind of a bummer. So I feel like yeah. it's all kind of perfect timing. Yeah, I mean, it just goes to show what you, that, what you just said about Alyssa, like the significance of this visibility, though, doesn't it? Because it's so important. It's so for, for, for kids to understand the alternatives that, that are out there and that it's fine. You know, you know, you just alluded to the facts, which I'm sure we'll get to, you know, the the standards that you were kind of felt like you needed to conform to when you were younger um, because you, because there was no visibility. Basically, there was no there was no there's nothing to, to, to hold yourself to. It's just so important, isn't it? I yeah. guess my next question would be, do you feel does it feel like we're at a wider tipping point right now? You know, you mentioned you know, we just discussed that. And then you mentioned the, um, the protests earlier mm-hmm. kind of feels there's some long buried reckonings happening right now. You know, there's conversations that are happening that have, that are finally out in the open and, that, and, you know, it's, it's obviously not going that smoothly a lot of the time, but it's so necessary, you know, yeah. do you feel, do, do you feel like, do you feel that, that, that that's a reality, this wider tipping point? Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously, I know that, like, people have been protesting for queer liberation forever and yeah. black liberation and POC and all kinds of shit, right? The shit, these protests are, like, not new. This isn't new. But because social media is, like, literally all we have right now, especially during quarantine. Um, yeah. It's kind of like, this is what you get to look at or whatever. I don't know. It's like, it's happening. And like, this is all that's happening. And like with police brutality and stuff, it's like, obviously people are fed up. I mean, this shit's been going on for like decades and decades. Um, But yeah, so by being able to like be visible and like have these conversations and kind of there's like nothing else to do right now except to like pay attention to the news. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like, yeah, there's still a long way to go. And it feels disheartening a lot, especially with like, I mean, in the in the U.S. with fucking Donald Trump just like (laughs) shitting on everybody. It's like it's I don't know, man. It's really. Yeah, it's really. It's a a, you got a perfect storm over there right now. haven't you You know, you've got obviously the the situation with the virus and then, you know, the most divisive leader. I mean, maybe ever over there, really it's it, it's definitely conflating all of these these issues really yeah so i guess from that perspective it must feel challenging really yeah because it's like it's one thing it's like super inspiring to like be with people and walk these marches and like walk them all for like all of us there are hundreds of people there for the same reason right we care about like black lives black lives matter and like queer lives matter like um during pride like obviously pride was like supposed to be canceled this year but because of the protests going on, the queer liberation march that happens every Sunday of Pride every year in New York was dedicated to Black Lives Matter. So like I was there with my partner and like some friends, but the march went on. It was just so many people. And like when you're in that space, it feels really safe. And like it's really awesome when people are all coming together for something that's like really fucking important. And a lot of people are saying, you know, like pride this year was the most authentic it's been in a very long time because, you know, corporations have taken over and just like turned it into something that it's not, but pride started out as a protest. So like the fact that we were marching in protest of the police and police brutality was, I don't know, really moving and really inspiring. But then when we're, we all retreat back into our quarantine, it's just like, All you see on the news is like, arrest the cops that killed Breonna Taylor, like say her name, say her name, say her name. And like just, I mean, her and so many others, countless others. And like hearing about like lynchings that happened like yesterday and the day before and the day before. It's like, the I don't know. It, it's just like, it feels like we're just trying to climb up a vertical wall or something. Like, it's just impossible to get it down. But I mean, obviously, as a white person, I'm like, it's not my struggle. I'm just trying to support. And I just can't imagine what it must feel like to be in that position and to have been in that position for literally the last 400 years in this country. 
Yeah, I think I think the kind of the shocking thing as well has been to has been to see the denial as well from people, you know, who are just flat out like, "There's no such thing as white privilege. There's no <laughs> such thing as, you know, like, <sighs> the, the, like how how polarized it's become." That's what's really. I've said this on this podcast before. I think that's what the last last few weeks that's what's really shocked me. Like I, I think my lazy assumption was that I just thought everybody knows that you know everybody accepts that situation everybody understands that there's such thing as systemic race racism or or privilege and, and actually realizing that people not only don't even really get what it is but when they kind of they just are like that's not true and it's like yeah what are you talking like how you know how can you even say that so like it is very dispiriting but at the same time i guess the reason i brought it up as like a conversation thing it does feel like the fact that these conversations a prolonged and so visible it has to be a good thing because it you know it i've spoken to some friends who have said it does feel a bit different it does feel like it's it's not just been one of those occasions where there's been a an event that's kind of catalyzed it and then it's gone away again for a bit you know it's been quite a prolonged conversation yeah and i do th- i do think with the election as well it's not going to go anywhere is it not for the next sort of five months no and like what i'm realizing too is like i mean obviously this is probably common knowledge to people who are like have their finger on the pulse with politics and just like what's happening in the world um but that just like protests like to make any real difference like they it's like a marathon not a sprint you can't just go out and protest for one weekend it's like days and days and months and like sometimes years of standing for something and I don't know. So, so yeah, it's, it's such a crazy time to be alive, I feel like. Um, But I don't know. It's cool that there's community and people like fighting for something and that I can be a part of that and support as much as possible. You know, I don't want to like stand in the way and like be a fucking white person taking up too much space. I just want to like be there to support in any possible way that I can. So yeah well that's been another theme hasn't it people sort of working out how to be an ally really and Mm -hmm. almost struggling with the that concept of where to where to be you know where where, where to be an effective ally for sure and it's it's honestly you know it's like even as somebody like me who I'm always trying to voice that or like inspire people to like become allies or to learn how to be allies for like queer or trans people right but like I'm also in a position where like I need to learn how to be a good ally. And yeah. so that's something I'm unpacking like every single day. Yeah. Well, I think that's another thing, isn't it? That you realize it's a, it's a, it's a life's work, really. You know, mm-hmm. you, you'll never you'll never learn enough, you know, because because there's always a situation that you, that you won't have experienced that you need to try and understand, which is which again is is difficult, I think. You know, and and, and you do have to work hard at that. You do have to try and well do the work do the work to understand it really yeah yeah for sure and it's like i feel like sometimes i'm just barely scraping the surface you know it's like obviously i'm human we're all fucking human and i'll yeah hopefully doing our best and you know sometimes it i mean i don't know i just want to like keep keep at it consistently even if it means just like learning one thing a day or like remembering one thing a day or like donating to an organization like once a week or just just keeping the momentum as much as possible and like yeah i think that's just the best way that i know how to approach it at this point yeah yeah no i i I empathize with that it's kind of it kind of sounds like the way that i feel about it as well you know you net i think that's kind of that that's 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 acceptable isn't it you know just to try and keep learning um keep your mind open and and also don't be too hard on yourself because it is a very yeah it's emotional and it's difficult it's hard work so you know um but i wanted to ask you about your year as well because mm-hmm. i it's the pleasure and the pain right that's the film you've just released yeah 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 there's a couple of really poignant lines in that there's one line there's a, at the end where you say um that this you that it feels like this is the best year ever you know you yeah. feel like you, you've never felt more like yourself mm-hmm. um which is which is really great so and and you know is that 
because you feel more like yourself than you ever have. You feel more able to be yourself. Yeah. So, you know, okay. So like going back during competitions and just kind of like, I mean, it all sort of slowly came to a head over the last like maybe five years. It's like, well, I've no, I've known myself that I, that I'm a trans person since I was like 22. And so I'm 28. Right. So that's like six years of like knowing this thing and avoiding it or just trying to figure out how it's going to work in my career. But it's like everyone knows me as Lacey Baker. And then like, if I'm not Lacey Baker, then who am I? Like, who's going to care or whatever. And so there was just like all this weight on, on being Lacey Baker or like being myself. Right. And so my world slowly started to fragment and then I, I had a nickname with close friends where people would call me Lee. And then it, in skate spaces, whatever, it's Lacey. But a lot of that time, those worlds overlap, right? So then people are like, well, what, what should I call you if it's like there's, you know, because they're like, I understand that hearing your dead name like doesn't feel good. And my friends don't want to make me feel that way. But then it's like if I'm in a space, they also are in a position where they're like trying to protect me and then use the pronouns that everyone knows I have so they don't out me and so that went on for since 2013 I remember that's when I started using the nickname Lee and so it just more and more and more like I don't know it was just really really an uphill battle and so it got to a point you know I, I really just like hit a wall with depression and like the amount of traveling I was doing was just like I mean because traveling itself comes with a load of baggage for me as a person like I the name on my passport the way people address me at the airport or any public space like whatever so all that shit was just like really exhausting and I was either like mentally preparing for like survival mode or like recovering from survival mode from being in skate spaces where I'm where then I have to be quote Lacey Baker so yeah, I was, I was going to say, because because you because you're also having to deal with that. Let's not forget the fact that you're in a very masculine culture that celebrates. You know, let's be honest, one version, mm-hmm. well, of, 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 like a bi- binary identities like that, you know. The, yeah. It, and, that's, and so that that is that that's must have been really, really stressful. Yeah, that was beyond words. Like, I can't even describe what it, it's just like trauma you know what i mean it's like my nervous system just got blown out from constantly trying to navigate like who am i in what space and when am i gonna have to be lacy baker again whatever so with all that being said about like a year ago i i got really depressed like bad like it was i had been sober for like almost a year and i got to the point where i was just like I can't fucking do this. Like I'm, I have no tools. I have like nothing to figure this shit out. And I was just like really hit my lowest depression that I've ever had. And so from that point, I, I don't know. It was just like, I got to pick myself up and figure it out. Meanwhile, it's like, oh, the skateboarding just got announced in the Olympics and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, oh my fucking God. So like the contests are more than ever. And it's just like, I feel like I'm just like banging my head into a wall. Anytime I go to a contest or just like knowing a contest is, I'm just like, dude, I don't know how I could fucking do this shit. So. Yeah. Cause that's the environment, right? Where you, it's, it's, <laughs> it's right there. You know, yeah. Like that's you like the worst people. one of, of the whole bunch. Yeah. But, um, so I took whatever I was like, I need to find a therapist. I think I might need to get on meds. So I, I just basically like, I, I was just like, all right, I'm fucking, everything's canceled right now and I just need to like focus on my mental health and that was like a little over a year ago I started therapy last year in April same with psych I got a psychiatrist so I got on antidepressants and then I started meditating every single day I got a trainer um her name is Jessica Alexander and she's the best and she also is very trauma informed just based on her experience and like So like when we met, I was like, oh, this person gets it. This person gets what I'm going through. Like I not only want to skate and be the best that I could be, but I'm also really struggling with my mental health, like really bad right now. And so she was the one who got me on my meditation and just like taking baby steps towards like mental health. And so 
I feel like I've, I've climbed out of the hole of depression with a lot of tools that I didn't have before. And part of climbing out of that hole was I have to come out, which obviously is like fucking scary. Um, but yeah, it was just like, I'm going to come out and I'm going to just like be one person. I'm not going to be like Lee in this group of people and then Lacey over here. Like, I'm just going to be Leo. I am trans. I am non-binary. And that is who I am. And so by doing that, it like a lot of the stress just sort of fell away. And like the silver lining for me of like coronavirus and all this shit is like, I'm not going, I'm not getting on an airplane. I'm not going to a contest anytime soon. Like I'm literally just like able to like be in therapy and like do my workouts and like skate and just unpack what it means for me to be a trans person. So those are the tools that help you cope with it basically that you found meditation, exercise, and by the sounds of it, a lot of honest self-reflection. Yeah, Which... absolutely. And, you know, if I had to rank the different tools I have in in order of effectiveness, I mean, they, they're all like pretty symbiotic together. They really help me develop this foundation that I haven't had before. But therapy and my willingness to accept the help is like the number one thing that has really helped me break down some of those walls. And I've been working with my therapist for over a year, like I said, and like, she's like one of the best people ever. Like another thing I do too, is like every morning I get up and I like write like what I'm grateful for and what I'm looking forward to. Just like a short thing usually takes like three minutes or five minutes. And it's just like, it seems really, I don't know. Like the ground, the, the grounding rituals though, aren't they? Do you know what I mean? They're like, yeah, they're, it's like it needs like to happen. It like yeah. really frames my, my, it puts my frame of mind in a place where I'm actively and intentionally appreciating stuff about yeah. like, instead of just like, you know, cause depression is a fucking something to be, it's just so bad sometimes. And so, you know, it's like this thing, like depression is just like a cactus growing in the fucking desert. It's there, it's gonna survive. Does it need anything, right? My mental health is like a, delicate garden that needs constant nurturing and so that is it's just it, that's kind of the juxtaposition of it it's like yeah no I totally, depression I totally, is gonna be there <laughs> yeah Whatever. you need to well you need to be proactive don't you like i think i think when people self-medicate and talking from experience you know like with booze or drugs or whatever it's it's just very reactive, isn't it? And you always pay the price. Like eventually, you yeah, f you feel like you you feel like you it feels like a release. It feels like an escape at the time, but then afterwards, it actually just contributes to the problem, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, well, I actually I got some I got a really great perspective, like a great new perspective on drugs and alcohol in therapy because. You know, it's like my in my frame of mind growing up, it was always so black and white. It's like, oh, I guess like I'm an addict, period. Right. Like I'm always going to fall back into that if I don't like run away from it or something. I don't know. But what my therapist helped me discover was that like actually drugs and alcohol is a way of a way of regulating your nervous system. And. I think that was like one of the most pivotal like moments for me because it's like I am regulating my nervous system. I am like, of course I'm like using drugs and alcohol to cope because I'm like constantly in survival mode and like it's exhausting yeah. on my nervous system. And the only way, the quickest, surest way to like ease that pain, even if it's for like a couple of hours is to like drink and do drugs if they're available, honestly. And like, and then it's like the next day, obviously you always feel like shit, but it's like, that's, I don't know. Like it, it became for me like, you know, cause I would constantly just like go, 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 like never give myself a chance to rest or like reflect because I'm just like trying to keep my mind busy so I don't fall yeah. into whatever thinking about shit that sucks, right? Um, and so my only way of slowing down was actually being hung over because then I like can't do anything. So I have to lay in bed all day. And that's obviously not a healthy thing, right? But these are yeah, the but... coping mechanisms I developed over these years of like 
being a trans person in the fucking closet and afraid to come out because like the world that I exist in does not have space for me. But I like, whatever. Yeah, it's like, it's a whole fucking thing. Well, that was the other line in, in, in the film that I thought was really poignant. It, I, I wrote it down because it, you, you said all the things that people were celebrating about me weren't me. Yeah. And that I, I was like, fucking hell, that's, that, that's you know, like, because it's not like you weren't successful. You know, you were successful. Your career was, was going very, very well. You know, you had a great profile. But to not be able to enjoy that because the things that were being celebrated in the culture weren't things you could identify with is a really horrible position to be in yeah and and a, and a real and you know it's not it's not surprising to hear you describe the the way it's affected you and and the, and the time it's taken you to get your head around that because because it is a, it is a really really un, unpleasant predicament to be in i think yeah well i could speak to that number one by saying that as a child, you know, like, I'm like, I'm getting my first sponsor, right? I'm 11 years old. I'm like, fuck yeah, this is awesome. I'm still dressing like a boy because at that time, like, I was like, quote, a tomboy, whatever. Like, that was, like, acceptable for the world. <laughs> so I'm a tomboy. I'm wearing baggy clothes. I'm just, like, dressing like a skater. And then just slowly, like, they're nudging me, like, just take this one pair of girl pants home. Like, you don't have to wear them. Just take them. And then, and then, like, fast forward and they're like the higher ups here actually really need you to be in the girls clothes because technically you're in the girls program right and but it's like slowly peeling parts of myself away that i'm like okay i guess i could do that all right i guess i could do this until i'm like i've i'm living this identity that like i did not create right these fucking people in this industry saw me as like a marketable skater when i grew up and they molded me into that without me even knowing. And so then I'm like, no sponsors, no, no anything. When I reach that point, I'm like, I don't even know who the fuck I am. <laughs> and so it was just like a really, it just like reality hit, you know? And I was just like, man, I need to figure some shit out. And so I had a really sort of tense phase of my life where I was like feeling really angry about shit just cause I'm like, I literally like lived your fucking dreams, like everyone else's dreams. Like, oh, I, I'm Lacey Baker, long hair, fucking skater girl. <laughs> and I'm just, I look back on old footage of me dressing like the way they wanted me to dress. And it's like cringy. Cause I'm like, that's not even close to who I am. And I didn't even get a chance to develop an identity. One was just created for me. So that was just like, such a bizarre experience to like reflect on. It's like, obviously I'm grateful because I'm like, I really know what it feels like to be authentic and I'm grateful for that. And I'm also like, man, like the binary and like patriarchy and all this shit that like rules our fucking worlds is so toxic for so well, many fucking people. Yeah, well you just, you know, you've just described it in action, haven't you? In, yeah. And, 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 and described the effects on you. And the, you know, there's another layer to this, which is, it's skateboarding. It's supposed to be a subculture that's accepting of, of outcasts or like whatever, you know, like of difference of, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like it, it, it that's what skateboarding is supposed to be about. So to, to be, to be like put in a position where you're told, well, you need to conform or else you're not part of this subculture is, is again, is just a total head fuck of a contradiction, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. I mean, skateboarding has been failed in this, you know, mask of we're progressive, we're a progressive group, we're different, whatever. But it's actually like when it comes down to the industry, it's like, no, the industry is just a function of like capitalism and patriarchy, period. And the people that are running the show are like mostly white dudes who don't fucking get it. And therefore there is like, like when it comes to like who is successful, like the diversity, it just, it, it's all like matches up with the imbalance of what's happening in at, in the world at large, I would say, or to, like mirrors it to some degree. And so, yeah, I feel like at the point we are now, it's like, yeah, there's a lot of space. There's a lot of new opportunities happening. People are opening up more and like accepting us, but it's because we've been fighting the fight. There, yeah. That shit was not good. They weren't gonna just like sit there and be like, oh, you know what we should do now? <laughs> 
<laughs> let's let's sponsor girl skaters for real. You know what yeah. I mean? Like no, like we have been pushing up against the industry for fucking years, even before my generation. Like Kara Beth, Mimi Noop, The Alliance, when they like yeah. they when they were fighting for um, just equal prize pay at X Games, and they like they like initiated this boycott. And so nobody's yeah. whatever. Like we've been, this shit's been going on for years, just like any De- other fucking decades. protest. Decades, yeah. yeah. I mean, when I spoke to Cara Beth, I actually couldn't believe some of the stories she was telling me because it it was just outrageous, really. And she was she was just really matter of fact about it. She was just like, well, that's just how it was, you know. And it's been like fucking, hell. <laughs> you know, like it's unbelievable. Um, so do you feel like? There's, there's a change though generally you know obviously we've talked about the importance of, of like the emblem of the Tony Hawk thing as, as like, a, like a symbolic change and stuff but in, in wider skate culture you know there's a few indications that it's changing insofar as these things are being talked about more and more and there's more spaces as you said does that does that feel like a, a real thing do you, do you feel like it is changing yeah yeah I do feel like it's changing because I mean, for so long, I've been sort of at the forefront of that change. Um, And so I can feel it and I can see it, but like it could easily just burn out if we burn out, if we stop fighting for it. It's like the only way the change is going to happen is if we continually push for it. And like it's going to be a slow burn, I would say, because... I mean, that's just how it is everywhere. Anywhere you're trying to make change. It's like these systems are so embedded in us that like, you know, even the smallest piece of change feels like a big deal because it's it's hard to get. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's nice to see. It's nice to see where change has happened and like, it's nice to know that like people are starting to listen, at least in our industry, at least in the skate industry. You know, I know obviously it's like this is one tiny piece of the world, um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a lot, man. Yeah, well, it's you know, like we say, it's supposed to be progressive. It's supposed to stand for this, really. So it is a good it is a good indicator I think of where we are like you say it is a metaphor for the way the conversation is going in the wider world because you know skateboarding has always been an outlier like that it's always it's always been ahead of the culture and then the culture's kind of caught up with hasn't it so Mm -hmm. it it is a really good indication um I guess that's one of the reasons you moved to New York then because you you obviously brought up in Southern California or were you born in Southern California is that right yeah but then was was the move to New York a, a way of getting more space getting away from that kind of toxic center of the industry um not exactly honestly I mean by that point you know when I moved to New York I was like that in the time leading up to that I didn't have sponsors I didn't have like whatever financial support I was like I had quit I had quit my job in July but I was like doing freelance graphic design and really just trying to skate and I think I was like 23 or 24 at this time so I was just like I remember I was just sitting at my desk being like one day, because I was really happy at my job. I was like, this has nothing to do with skating. What and, was the job? Um, I worked at I worked at a uh, light company doing graphic design. So I would like oh, do sweet. catalog layouts and like product photography, promos and whatever. So, and it had nothing to do with skating. And I told my boss, because I was like, yeah, sometimes I travel to contests like once or twice a year. And she was like, that's fine. But I was like, don't, can you like not tell anyone that like I skate? Because I just don't want people like, fucking asking me questions about it and so she kept it like super low-key so I would like be gone for like weeks at a time and it was just like nobody was like really paying attention and then (laughs) uh when I won the x games in 2014 like obviously it's on like ESPN so like everybody in like the sales department they like watch sports right on the weekends and so I came back to work like that following Monday and everybody was just like who the fuck are you? Like, and I was like, oh <laughs> God, I'm like, I've been exposed. But uh, that's, that's no, um, but yeah, anyway, so eventually I was like, dude, I, I have to skate. Like, I can't be working. I can't be, as much as I love the people here and working here, it's like, I should be skating. So whatever, I quit my job and I was just like trying to figure out what like my next move was. And I had been working on that video part on Thrasher called My World and uh, yeah. And I won that that super crown that year, so I think that's sort of what 
got people's attention after all those years of nobody paying attention or giving a fuck. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good, good calling card. You know, it's a good yeah. few things to to put you up there. Yeah, but uh, I mean, I just I visited New York that summer and I just was like fell in love with it. So moving there just felt like the right thing to do. It wasn't really like I was escaping anything. I just like felt so alive being there. You know, yeah. like I spent like a month there in the summer like right before SLS that in 2016. And I was just like, fucking, this is like the best place in the world. So that was kind of why I moved there. Plus like, yeah, in comparison to LA, it's like, I definitely wanted to get out of there cause it's so isolated and like, just so fucking boring. Like, I don't know, <laughs> like skating, everything is so spread out. So it's like just too much planning to get the least amount of fun in where like New York, you're like, you're outside and you're just like, I'm having fun. <laughs> like I'm yeah, in New York. I, I'm fucking going to get a coffee and go skate. I can't stand the amount of driving you've got to do in California. It's just, <laughs> it's just that it's maddening. It's, yeah. one, of the, it's one of the things I, I'm just always, you know, I live in England. So it's, it's for us, it's like, what you got to drive like three hours to like do something. It's like, yeah, yeah I, I way prefer no. it when you can just walk around and cruise it, you know, Mm -hmm. so you one of the things you've also talked about recently is um when you did come out and present as masculine that it did have, did have an effect on your career um you know like it did because you've described this arc you were on this you know like like the lacy arc if you like and then at the point that you decided to kind of show your true self you've said that it did affect your career in the industry so how how did that um, manifest itself what just like sponsors dried up or like media what what did that yeah, look like yeah i mean that sort of coincided with the recession in 2008 so by like 2009 2010 companies were like cutting their skate programs or just like straight up firing people like whatever just because there wasn't like a lot of money in it um so like you know of course like of of the bunch right if we're talking about like the patriarchy and like the systems that like rule our worlds, <laughs> you know, obviously a, a fucking butchy boy looking dyke fucking skater like me with a shaved head isn't going to get a contract over the prettiest skater ever. Right. Or what they perceive as that. So sort of, I just like all the sponsors went away and people were like, well, you could easily get like another board sponsor, whatever. And I was like, trying to I tried like a lot of different companies like five I think like five different brands like just reaching out being like hey like I'd love to skate for you blah 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 and just like no response like nothing and I was like all right sick so this is where we're at cool <laughs> and I'm like you know I think part of it had to do with presenting authentically and like I'm queer and people don't know what to do with that a lot of times especially in like mainstream culture so yeah there just kind of wasn't anything there for a while and that's like when i got my job and stuff right but okay. it was kind of a blessing in disguise i would say because i needed time to figure myself out like i didn't have that time ever growing up i was always like i had sponsors breathing down my neck you gotta dress like this you gotta look like this you gotta fucking wear this put this logo on you yeah. have to wear the backwards hat it's part of your brand like i don't know people were just like and so it's like it's really hard to decipher like what decisions I'm making and what decisions are being made for me. Yeah, right. Yeah. And what being forced upon you basically by expectation. And I guess, like you say, that breathing space meant that when Nike did come along, you were probably in a better position to understand what you wanted out of that relationship, right? Yeah, for sure. And that was what was really special about that is because, you know, when I got their attention, I guess you could say, like, I was my head was fucking shaved and I was like, you know, like I just, I bind my chest. I'm getting top surgery this year, but like I wear a binder. So it's like, I, I don't look like a boy or I'm just like somewhere in the middle. And for them to express interest in me when that is how I'm presenting myself, it's like, I know it's like, it's a celebration of who I actually am, not like what what ideas they have for me and how they're planning to like mold me into their like most marketable fucking skater. They're just like, we love you exactly as you are. Like, we would love to support you. And I'm like, this is super rewarding. And I'm really glad that, I mean, I wouldn't change it for anything, you know, 
like that experience and just like, you know, cause as invalidating as it was my whole life to be molded like that, to then have someone come along and like really embrace me for me. It's like that, that feeling, I don't know. I just feel like it's really special or something, you know? Yeah. Well, you can see it, you know, you can see with, uh, with, with what you did, you know, you can see that the, it's a partnership more than the classic kind of sponsor skater athlete, whatever role where it's a bit like there's, there's a role to fill. There's a box to tick, you know, mm-hmm. like it, it, it feels different for sure. Yeah. Um, which is why I kind of asked the question really. Cause I think you, like you say, you do need to go through these experiences to understand what you actually want and, and who you are. And that's the same, it's the same for anybody, isn't it? You know, yeah. that, like it's, yeah. it's, it's a part of, you know, we all go through that and it never ends as well. You know, mm-hmm. like it's an ongoing thing. So how are you feeling now? I mean, yeah, I do feel like, I mean, obviously we didn't expect a pandemic to happen, but you know, I feel ex- like I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. Like, and that feels super good. Like I don't have to walk around trying to figure out what I'm supposed to be in what setting and who I'm around, like I can just fucking exist, period. And like, that's amazing. And so, you know, by by reaching that level and then continuing to like meditate and like do gratitude lists and just like really appreciate life every day, it's, it's like, I don't know, man. It took a long time to get here, but I'm like really fucking happy. And I don't think it's gonna, um, it, I don't think it's gonna, go backwards again. Like I was going in circles for a long time, just hitting the same wall because I like wasn't living my true authentic self, you know? And so now that I've reached this level, it's like, it's not gonna go back. I'm, I can just go forward now. It's not like depression isn't gonna happen, but it's like, as long as I continue on this path of like prioritizing my mental health and like being authentic, then I think I'm gonna be okay. Um, and I guess I'm guessing the Olympic postponement is 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 a is a good thing, you know, because it it kind of by the sounds of it, that's kind of probably the last thing you needed, right, to actually like have to have to deal with the biggest profile skateboarding event in history. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, you know what I mean. Like, it, it, so how are you feeling about that now? Because obviously they're saying it's going to happen next year. But you mentioned the competition thing. You mentioned the fact that that's a very particular environment where these issues came to the fore. Um, and obviously, really, with you with your skating, you've been concentrating on film parts and just skating, really. So, mm-hmm. how are you feeling about that? Um, I've just I'm. It's on the back burner. I don't really spend too much time thinking about it at this moment, just because like it's something that has been very triggering for me in the past, and I'm just focusing on now and like where when they when things start to pick back up again if they ever do i'm like i don't know what's gonna happen but yeah well there is that you know i'm just like i'll like revisit that thought down the road when i get yeah there. but for now i'm just like i'm skating i'm fucking meditating and like i'm eating healthy and i'm just that's it <laughs> yeah know? and i'm lucky you know i'm like in a really unique position to be able to just skate and like i'm just very grateful for that so like i don't want to get bogged down by like fucking adjacent skate adjacent shit that like i don't need to worry about like the olympics and competitions right now i'm like i can go outside and fucking skate and like yeah that's probably what i'm gonna do after we get off this call (laughs) because yeah and so yeah it's just i'm just like trying to be in the moment as much as i can yeah well the other thing i wanted to ask you about was the new york skate project Mm-hmm. which is which is obviously something that you have been heavily involved well it's your it's your thing right so can you tell me tell me a little bit about that absolutely so yeah so like when I moved to New York you know I was I obviously noticed right away like how vastly diverse the skate scene is in New York and in Brooklyn um and I was inspired by Kristen Ebeling and like what she does at Skate Like a Girl, which is like an organization where they create space for like marginalized people to skate and like feel safe. Um, So I just kind of felt like New York deserved to have that and like I deserve to have that because 
I've been skating by myself my whole fucking life. Like I'm typically just like a loner, which is fine. I'm not being all like, oh, cry for me. But like, it's just like my, it's like natural to who I am. So to then create a space where it's like, these are people that I can relate to on like multiple different levels. That's just what I wanted. I just wanted community. I wanted people who like get it, get what I feel, get what I'm going through. And like, it was a really beautiful thing the way it came to be. Cause I was like, yeah, like I just kind of want to start something, but I want it to be everyone. So it's like anyone can have an idea. Like it's like, I've, it's like creating something and then being like, okay, this is on the table for anybody to do anything they want with, if that makes sense. I know it's like kind of conceptual and like abstract, but like, it's not, I don't think of it as mine. I just think of it as like the community and we yeah, all like get to do stuff. A creative platform that people can do what, what they want with. Yeah. Which again yeah. is, is kind of the point of skateboarding, isn't it? You know? Yeah. So. Yeah. Nice. So you're going to go for a skate. Well, I'll let yeah. you go. I, I mean, I'll I mean, uh, skate some flat for a bit. Looks like it might rain, but yeah. That, I mean, that was an hour that flew by. Um, Hey, Leo, yeah, thank you so much. That was really great. Yeah, yeah I'm glad um, we finally got to do this. So there you go. That was me and Leo Baker, and I hope you enjoyed that episode. As mentioned, if you're new to the show, please check out the show notes for more background on the things we discussed. You can find this over at my website, www.wearelookingsideways.com. You can find the full archive, including an interview with skateboarders like Jamie Thomas, Sam McGuire, Cara Beth Burnside, Andy Howell, and countless more. Yeah. Go and have a look. Reckon you'll find some other stuff to dig into if you like this. So as regular listeners will know, this is the part of the show that I call Housekeeping Corner. And there's a few things to chat about this week. One of which was the best complicel I've received for a while. Now, again, regular listeners will know that I very much enjoy collecting complicels, which is an insult wrapped in a compliment. So yeah, I got a good one over Instagram. People always message me on instagram and get some dialogue going over there i'm at we look sideways and i think this might also be my first experience of being properly mansplained now i'm sure it's happened before but this is a proper job from a listener who did send me a really nice message about the phil young and lauren mccallum episodes and then closed it off by saying so thanks for that mate i still think you talk over people too much and sometimes miss golden opportunities to deep dive some of the topics which are raised but I'm a victim of doing both of those things myself when interviewing people. Once again, big props from here. Keep pushing those important topics. Now, I don't mind admitting there was something about the tone of this one that kind of got me. You know, who knows how these things work? I get a lot of messages about the podcast. Very, very fortunate that I've got people getting in touch all the time to give me feedback and criticism and all the rest. And, you know, I've had way worse, to be honest. But I don't know, something about that one could have been the use of the term deep dive, which is always a bit of a red flag to me, given it's one of those sort of Tim Ferriss-esque modern phrases. It doesn't really mean much. Popped up out of nowhere and now is in universal usage. But to be honest, I think it was more something that I've long found fascinating about people and their reaction to things. Now, I've been making things and putting them out into the wider world for pretty much my whole adult life. Books, magazines, music, podcasts, loads of stuff really. And I've always found the human ability to look at something through an entirely self-centered lens, endlessly fascinating. As in, I like this, therefore, why is this other thing not more like the things I like? I remember once playing a friend of mine a song I'd written. He did ask if he could hear it. So I played him this song and his response was, I really like that new Primal Scream song. Couldn't you make it a bit more like that? Now, I was genuinely lost for words at that. Initially, at the realization that he genuinely thought that that was a valid observation. But then when I thought about it, I kind of realized, you know, in some ways, it is a valid observation. And it is the way that most people in the world seem to judge these things. After all, he liked the new Primal Scream song. Therefore, why not offer the response that my song would be better if it sounded a bit more like Primal Scream? Now, obviously, from my point of view, whether or not the song sounded like Primal Scream had never entered my head of a, as a metric of criticism I might have to concern myself with. 
I'd just been trying to create something honest, original and true and had rather hoped it might be judging that spirit because, you know, it's fucking hard writing music, especially playing it to somebody. And I think that's what I was reminded of in this case because after all, whether some future correspondent was worried about whether I'd take a deeper dive into subject they're interested in, in specific interviews, hadn't really crossed my mind when I started this podcast. Um, and it's not really crossed my mind that often in the intervening three and a half years and in the intervening thousands of hours that I've spent putting together this free and ad-free podcast. Indeed, it was a conscious decision not to worry about that stuff that led me to start the podcast and completely please myself in how I presented it and pursued it. But still, as the audience has grown, and it's growing pretty quickly these days, you know, going to blow my own trumpet a little bit there, although I dare say I'm losing a few listeners by the second, I'm noticed I'm getting way more of these types of observations. Now, that they are always from men, and that is true. I literally have never had one from a woman. They're always from men. But in the interest of balance, I should say that I read that message out to my wife and she said, well, he's got a point. You do interrupt people. Now, stung by this, which, you know, as you can probably tell, hit me right in the ego. I put something on Instagram, as is my want, and I got the usual range of responses. I got people saying, well, yeah, you do actually interrupt people. And then I got, admittedly, there weren't that many of them. Um, But then I got a few, way more, obviously, from people saying, God, people are mad. You know, you, you're actually quite a sensitive interviewer. And anyway, you couldn't get a word in edgeways in the Andy Howell one. But thinking about it honestly, I do think there was some justice in the uh, observation that I talk over people too much. So I did I did give it some thought. And I realized that Zoom has hugely exacerbated that issue. Now, I was pretty militant about doing the podcasts in the same room as my guest I think before lockdown I'd only ever done two over Skype out of about 115 since then obviously I've had to do them all on Zoom and I gotta be honest I quite like it I can do them in my shed I can speak to people I won't have a chance of speaking to I think I'm going to carry on with the Zoom thing to be honest like everyone else don't don't tell anyone though but you know the thing about Zoom is it is different because those visual clues that you rely on are removed and you know thinking about it when you're in a room with somebody and you're having a conversation it is subtle you know you don't need to say something to get somebody's attention you don't need to like you don't actually need to sort of interrupt them really you can get their attention to to convey you want to say something in in a number of different ways but you can't do that with zoom and i've I've actually done a couple recently where the guest has insisted that we don't use video which makes it even harder to get a word in edgeways And that does mean that sometimes you basically need to interrupt. And then there's the other thing, which is it's a conversation. Now, I'm not sure if you've noticed, but when ordinary human beings have a conversation, especially one that's going well, they are full of interruptions. It's just how people chat is definitely how I chat. Um, And as I say fairly frequently, it's my show that I put out for free. There's no ads in it. It takes literally thousands of hours of my life Plus, people seem to really like it. So, on reflection, I'm going to keep on doing it this way and pleasing myself with it, really. I do appreciate the complice salt, though, which, like a butterfly collector, I have pinned, mounted, and stored in my mental repository, repository even, of such things. True story. Now, incidentally, I do know that I sound like a right fragile, whiny twat saying all this. Thing is, I'm up for some criticism, And I think recent episodes would back me up on saying that I'm happy to take it on the chin and I'm happy to explore these things. I'm just not sure this type of observation counts as criticism, to be honest. Well, that said, I have just dedicated a five minute section at the end of Housekeeping Corner to it. So what do I know? All getting a bit meta, they say. Probably a good time, segue alert, to bring up the Looking Sideways book, volume one then. So I've been mentioning this for about a year, actually. And the news is we're going to do it. Me and Owen have made some really good headway. We're going to crowdfund it via Kickstarter. I know, I know it's pretty whack doing that. We did look into other avenues. 
But the thing about Kickstarter is it is unrivaled as a way of seeing if there's a market for something. So that's what we're going to do. We've been pulling it together. We've got contributions from Jamie Brissick, Cersei Wallace and Craig Peterson planned. We've got a beautiful platform for all Owen's amazing photography. I've been working on a Kickstarter film with my very talented and generous friend Ben Hall who has uh, agreed to do that for free because he likes the podcast because he's a nice lad. And we're going to try and launch the thing at the end of August. Now there's going to, sorry, at the beginning of August. That's the beginning of August. So it's going to be three levels of reward, which I've got to be honest, we haven't quite decided upon yet. But basically it's book pre-orders. If you like the idea of the book and you want it to happen, we're going to need you to pre-order a book. And then if we hit enough numbers, we'll have a book and you'll have a book and everyone will be happy. If we don't hit the number of pre-orders, I'm not going to take it personally. I'm just going to get on with my life and I'm probably just going to be really happy that me and Owen got to work on something else. And yeah, there we go. So book coming soon, Kickstarter, short version. If you want day-to-day -day updates, probably best to head on over to my Instagram at We Look Sideways. You can also send me DMs and you might end up in here, be warned. Um, you can sign up to my newsletter via the internet and I send that out every two weeks. You might have heard of the internet. It's um, it's quite an innovation. Anyway, via that internet, you get two, every two weeks you get a newsletter from me, which is the 10 things that I think are worth sharing that week. Blimey, that turned into an epic. We do need some kind of Adam and Joe style Black Squadron designation for the people that make it this far. I think I do occasionally get messages from people saying, I listen to, I always listen to all the housekeeping corner. So if that's you and you do listen to housekeeping corner, drop me a message, let me know. In the meantime, I'll be back next week with another episode and more of the same. Nice one. Mm -hmm.